All right, if you remember yesterday, if you're with us, we ended uh, chapter seven with this little sort of insertion that says in brackets, the earliest manuscripts do not include 753 through 811, uh, the woman caught in adultery, and then it says this, um, they each went to his own house, which seems to be like the conclusion of what was being said in chapter seven. And then basically, Everything the first 11 chapters uh, first 11 first 11 verses of chapter 8 all through here um, Is It's it, this is different. So we don't we don't see this sort of bracketed um, Declaration often now I, I want to talk about two things and and again um, This is going to be a little bit more academic, but I chose to go this direction because I would, I would imagine most people have questions about this, and so I took the time to do a little bit more research on this, uh, both for myself and, and to share with you, but, I, but I, again, I want to remind you, the primary purpose of this and of Bible time is devotional Bible reading, not academic study, and there is a difference, difference between the two. And so, while I'm going to share some academic thoughts with you, um, let's keep the, the main thing the main thing in this time which is that this is relational, devotional, grow in my relationship with God, Bible time. Um, so, but because I knew that you'd have questions, um, this section is, uh, let, me, let me say like this, two things. Sometimes what we see is a critique that certain verses or words are not included in the version that we might be reading, whereas they are included in different versions. Um, and typically the reason for that, especially in like the version that I read, which is the ESV, which is a newer translation and one of the most word for word accurate translations along with the NASB and a few others. Um, maybe I'll do a video on translation sometimes and, and the validity and the nature of the different styles of them. But sometimes like in my world, sometimes I get the critique, oh, the, the King James you know, has a word and, and, and your version leaves it out or your version leaves out this verse. And typically the translator's choice is if there's an older manuscript that had been found, they're going to use whatever the oldest manuscript is that we have our possession of to create the most accurate translation. So even though there's this weird phenomenon of King James only fanatics out there, um, I don't personally believe that the King James, the King James version translated in like 1611 comes from all of the manuscripts that are, that are actually the oldest that we have now found since that translation came out, uh, in particular the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, um, Anyway, I, I don't want to get too much into that and take too much time about that, but that would be why some words are excluded from, say, the ESV, but included in the KJV. Now, this is the other side of the coin. Why is something included when they're actually going out of their way to tell us, hey, some of the earliest manuscripts don't include this? And there's actually a big debate about this. Um, I think this is called the, the peri pericope adulterae which is the term denoting this whole section about the woman caught in adultery. And it's pretty well um, agreed upon that it's not in the earliest manuscripts, but there's enough uh, reference to it. There's enough, um, uh, not just commentaries, but uh, yeah, just ancient references to this, even as early as the fourth century um, and it being placed either at the end of the Gospel of Luke or here in John or at the end of the Gospel of John that um, there's there's enough belief in it that this is that this is accurate original source and the very least represents uh, the character of Jesus and the behavior of Jesus so um, I think that it's honorable that they include this because you know we want to be able to trust what it is that we uh, are reading in the, in the scripture and, um, you know, personally, I do believe that this represents the Jesus that I know and, ha and see throughout the New Testament. Although, academically, it is something to be evaluated and looked at. So, that being said, let's jump in and let's just ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us 
uh, from these 11 verses and beyond whatever it is he wants to speak to us. So, sorry for the five minute uh, introduction, but I, I knew that there'd be some questions, and so I wanted to take the time to do the study on that particular thing. So here we go. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. Okay, so the center of religious life. All the people came to him. He sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. Um, so a few thoughts come to mind. If a woman's been caught in adultery, then surely there was a man. If they caught her in the act of adultery, surely there was a man involved as well. Where's that guy? I don't know. And placing her in the midst, who knows what she was wearing? Who knows if she was crying? Who knows if she was half dressed or, uh, you know, I don't know. Surely embarrassed and now probably fearing for her life because the penalty, according to the law, was death. And they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? They said this to test him. This is one of those places where, um, you know, it, it goes out of its way to, to say that they're asking him something specifically with the desire to to test him. Not per se, just to know what his thoughts were. And the reason they wanted to test him is that they might have some charge to bring against him. Now Jesus does this weird and interesting thing. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And, that, and as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Now, great debate, really not debate, but guessing has been um, postulated as to what it was that Jesus was writing. You know, was he just uh, fiddling in the ground to take everybody's attention like off of the woman onto like whatever he was doing? Was he drawing? You know, was he playing tic-tac-toe? Uh, you know, another idea, um, and, and one that I personally lean towards, although again, there's no evidence for this, but what I tend to believe is that Jesus was writing sins and that he knew what that guy's sin was and that guy's sin and that guy's sin and that guy's sin, and, guy's sin, and he was writing the sins in the ground on the ground that specifically applied to the people standing around him. Um, again, who knows? But I, I kind of like that idea, and maybe there's a hint of like the oldest to the youngest starts leaving, and so the oldest, you know, soberly is woken up with wisdom to be like, oh man, I I have committed that sin. And then the next guy's like, oh, I, I did commit that sin. And so they each knew because his response was, hey, who, hey, yeah, totally, let's do it. Whoever has no sin, go ahead and throw the stone. And then they start walking away as he's writing. So that leads me to think like, okay, if you don't have sin, go ahead and do it. And then maybe he starts writing sins and they're like, oh man, that is me. I don't know. Nevertheless, Jesus is awesome and they leave. And so this is the exchange that takes place between him and her. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Now, I absolutely love this um, because, you know, whether or not you choose to say hey, academically I, I don't know if I can embrace that section um, just based on you know academic research um, to me I think that this statement right here absolutely reverberates through the character uh, of Jesus the actions of Jesus and the theological message of the New Testament which is that Jesus did not come to condemn us but to call us out of our sin through grace and forgiveness. And that's exactly what this statement and this account basically expresses to us. And so um, I think that it's a, a, a great story 
and a great message to be included because it succinctly paints the picture of exactly what we know to be true of why Jesus came. So that's my thought about it. We can move on. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Did you catch it? This is one of the seven I am statements. I am the light of the world. Now, I think this is number two. Let's look real quick. And it is. This is number two of seven of the I am statements. The first one was bread, and the second one is light. Now, um, let's talk about this. Uh, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And um, I love this because I told you a few, uh, I think, yeah, a few, few chapters ago, probably whenever we saw the first one, which is in John chapter 6, uh, that one of the seven statements that he specifically applies to himself and, and denote his, his character, his identity, and his purpose, one of those statements is also applied to us, and that's this one. And where that comes from is uh, Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Right? A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Let your light shine before men so, they, so that they might see your good deeds and bring glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so all the other six are statements that are only about Jesus. And really, ultimately, He is the light of the world. But I love this because it says that, that we will have the light of life. And so when we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, the presence of Jesus, we also are the light of the world. And that came right out of his mouth. So we know that we can uh, grab onto that and know that it's true. So I just want to encourage you, friend, that uh, as much as these statements are specifically about Jesus, this one is also about you. So maybe that would be an aspect to think about, to pray about today. How am I shining? How am I being a light? When people look at me, do they see and experience and feel the darkness? Or do they see and experience and feel the warmth of light and love reverberating from the Spirit inside of me? All right, this is what it says. So the Pharisee said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I come from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. Uh, this is interesting that he may not be persuading them, but his confidence comes from where he came from, where he's going, who he came from, and who he's going to. And so I think there's something in there for, for us to apply to our life um, you know, you, you know where you came from and probably more important for us, we know where we're going. And so we can have confidence in this life because of where we're going. He says, you judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, Therefore, where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him, because his hour had not yet come. Um, that's maybe the third or the fourth time that we've seen that statement. So he said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me. You will die in your sin. Okay. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. He said to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Hmm. 
So they said to him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, Just as I have been telling you from the beginning, I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world that I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And he was saying these things, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. Lots going on in there. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I love it. This is a, you know, a really good 4th of July verse for us. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We're all about freedom here. But I like this. Uh, it says... The Jews who had believed, okay, so there were there were those who believed in him, which we already talked about the importance of believing. Uh, we already talked about how they said, what are all the works that God requires of us? And, and Jesus says, the work of God is this, is this, to believe in the one that he sent, John 6, 28, 29. And so now it says, specifically the Jews who believed, and then he says, now to the, to the ones who believed, if you abide in my word you are truly my disciples okay so we're beginning to see that there's not like a distinction between believing but really the fullest expression of what believing actually is is to be a full uh full-blown follower disciple of jesus so we have to remember that that when jesus says in 6:28 to believe in the one he sent, he's not talking about the same type of belief that the demons have that you would find in, I think, James chapter 2, where he, he points out this clear reality that we all know. Even the demons believe in God and shudder. Like, this reality that the demons know that God exists, right? They're not oblivious to that fact. But them believing in his existence is not the believing that Jesus is talking about. I grew up for the first many years of my life believing that God existed like I believed he was real I believed Jesus lived 2,000 years ago and did what he did but I didn't believe in him like he didn't have my heart I wasn't his disciple and so what he's pointing out here is so important he's beginning to to elaborate on what it looks like to believe in the fullest sense that he desires for us that you would abide in his word and then you're his disciple right and then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free and so a real disciple is somebody that believes somebody that abides somebody that follows somebody that's found freedom in him see you see how this is getting a little deeper and you know if you're looking for um, some application today like ask yourself these questions you know do do I believe do I abide do I love his word do I study his word do I eat his word do I do I do I feel like I'm a disciple you know, if I was in a court of law um, and they're putting me on trial, like, would there be enough evidence to convict me of being his disciple? Have I found freedom or am I on the path to freedom? It's good to take inventory of our own spiritual life and walk with him. Now, what happens here is he talks about freedom and they say, they answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and we've never been enslaved to anyone, which is weird because after Abraham came the captivity in Egypt, slaves and the whole like biggest part about this Israelite story is them being delivered from slavery via Moses. So I don't know what they're talking about, but anyway, I guess they're saying us personally, but the reference to the past is, is just weird. How is it that you say you will become free? Now listen, now listen, if you're looking for some application today, Jesus answered them, truly, truly, listen up. I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave 
to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever, but the son remains forever. If the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. So, my application here, do you sometimes stumble or do you practice? Do I make it my strive to follow God, uh, my desire to honor God? Is it my, my heart and my motivation to to do what God wants and, and sometimes because I'm human I stumble and I fall and I sin or am I practicing am I intentionally choosing am I making the choices to put myself in the position where I'm, I'm practicing sin am I a slave to it are you and then this is beautiful if the sun sets you free indeed you will be free I know that you are offspring of, offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my words find no place in you. I speak of what I've seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Uh-oh, <laughs> the devil. They answered him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to, the, to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But... Now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works that your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not on my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot uh, bear to hear my word. Now, now he's said a few times, Abraham's not your father. You're of a, you are of your father, your father, your father. Now he's going to define who that is. You are of your father, the devil. Uh-oh. <laughs> and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand with the truth because there is no truth in him, the devil. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Wow, this is intense. Imagine how they're feeling right now few things to point out he is the father of lies he is a liar he was a murderer from the beginning of course talking about the devil and he's saying like you guys desire to do your father's desires so yeah if jesus said that to us we'd probably be uh, pretty upset or down um they're not happy So I don't know if you're getting anything out of this, but for me, I just, I'm always, as a, as a preacher of truth, uh, for me, it's the concept of, of telling the truth in line is so important. And I have this conversation with my kids. I said, if there's one thing that Browns don't do, it's lie. I cannot let lying stand in my house. Um, because, so we have to train them as young people and, and I, I can't let lying um, even the tiniest bit a white lie reside in me because I'm a speaker of truth and the truth is whether you're a preacher or pastor if you are if you're a, a follower of Jesus you have a mandate on your life to tell the truth and to not lie because the devil is a liar 
It's what he's been doing from the beginning is lying and deceiving and God tells the truth. And so if we don't stand for it, if we don't stand for anything else, we have to stand for the truth and we have to speak the truth. We have to be people that no matter what people look at us, they know that we speak the truth because truth is of the utmost importance. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. If you line yourself up with lying, you line yourself up with the devil. If you line yourself up with the truth, you line yourself up with God, period. The Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? What kind of question is that? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died as did the prophets, yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. They, they didn't have the framework to even comprehend what he was talking about, eternal life. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say, he is our God. But if you have, if you, but you have not known him, I know him. If I were to say, if I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you, but I do know him and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. And the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Now listen. And Jesus said to them, Amen, Amen. Truly, truly, listen up. I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Why did they pick up stones to throw at him? because of what he just said. What about what he just said made them want to pick up stones and throw at, him, throw at him? Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, this is a, this is a bonus I am. Because it's not actually one of the seven. I'll call it the great number eight. Um, and the bonus of this I am is this. I'm going to close with this. This is one of the places where we know that Jesus is actually referring to himself as God. And what he's doing here and why they picked up stones is because they knew exactly what he was saying. Because God's name, if you recall, in the Old Testament, as found in Exodus chapter 3, when he shows up to Moses, and Moses says, Who should I say is sending me to Pharaoh? He says, Tell him that I am sent you. Uh, or I am that I am the name that God reveals to Moses and his name that is the chosen and the most the most uh, holy name um, is the name Yahweh, yod heh vav -He, and that means I am. And so when he's talking about even the patriarch Abraham, who's not nearly as important as Yahweh, God himself, Jesus is saying, I existed before Abraham because I am God who was with God in the beginning, who was God. Through me, all things are created. The earth is created. I am God. When he just says before Abraham was, I am, they knew that he was saying, I am Yahweh. And so that's awesome. And that's also leading to a lot of problems for him. And of course, his eventual arrest, crucifixion, and death. So I'm going to close for today um, this video. I want to encourage you to spend some time in prayer. There's a number of things that I think are highly worthy of reflecting upon. Um, your truth versus lies. Who do you line up with? Are you a slave or are you free? Do you, do you abide in him? Um, or, you know, he's the light of the world. Are you the light of the world? or anything that might be gleaned from the story of the woman caught in adultery and Jesus' grace towards her, but then calling her up and out of sin. 
So I hope you got something out of today. I hope that you spend some time with the Holy Spirit and that he leads, guides, and directs every aspect of your day. Uh, thanks for joining me today. I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. God bless.